Um, I would like just to um, open us up very quickly and introduce our speakers and then I'll, I'll clear the stage for um, Andrea and Mario. I really wanted to, uh, my name is Einat, I'm the uh, clinical manager for behavior support um, services, senior services in the Toronto Central Lynn. I really wanted to welcome everybody uh, to our BSO COVID and responses and responsive behaviors, um, lessons learned from the first wave education series. Uh, this is our first uh, session out of the four sessions that we're gonna have in the series in the, in, in, in the following Tuesdays, upcoming Tuesdays. Uh, and this series is a collaboration of the Behavior Support for Seniors program at the Toronto Central Lynn, the Center for Learning, Research and Innovation at Baycrest, uh, the PRC program of Toronto, Alzheimer's Society of Toronto, and also in today is session uh, participation from Toronto Rehab uh, Institute. Um, and in each session, we will uh, cover practical topics that have emerged during the first wave of uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, such as uh, how to deliver a person-centered uh, infection control um, practice, but also supportive communication and solutions and resources for mi meaningful engagement during social isolation, how to support and respond to the anxiety of families and caregivers during the pandemic. And we will also share uh, some of the vast amount of work that was done by our um, addictions uh, specialist around supporting smoke cessation in long-term care homes over COVID and, and learning from that success as well. A few very quick housekeeping stuff. I wanted to uh, let you know that we will be recording those sessions. The sessions uh, will be available, the recordings will be available after the sessions, uh, both on our BSO website and the uh, Center for Learning Research and Innovation website. We will send you those links um, once the, the videos are available. Uh, we also uh, have people from across the province joining us today. Most are joining by Zoom, but some might be joining us on YouTube. We are doing a private uh, live streaming to YouTube. Um, and, uh, and so I just wanted to uh, have people aware of it and that's to allow people that don't have access to Zoom to participate. So those of you that are on YouTube, I wanted to, if you wanted to ask questions or post comments on the YouTube chat, you do need to be uh, logged into your Google account if you have one you know, in order to do that. And our moderator will try to copy and paste those comments into the Zoom session so we can respond to them. Uh, also keep in mind that there is a 30 second time lag between our session and the live streaming on YouTube. And of course the live streaming on YouTube and the session and the chat will be deleted uh, after the session. Um, we will also at the, towards the end of the session, you'll see some poll questions uh, coming up on your screen. Uh, we would really appreciate it if you participated in those uh, so we can learn from this session and make uh, and, and improve our sessions as we go and learn and learn what worked and, and didn't work for you. So our topic for today uh, will focus on how to deliver person-centered infection control and the dementia and isolation uh, toolkit. I am very pleased to introduce you to Dr. Andrea Iaboni. Uh, a geriatric psychiatrist at Toronto Rehab Institute and a valued lead and advocate in our community for people with dementia and responsive behaviors. She is also the creator of the Dementia Isolation Toolkit that you, tool that you will hear about today and that you can see the link for on the screen. Uh, joining her is Mario Tsokas, who is a, a psychogeriatric resource consultant working uh, uh, out of the Toronto Rehab Institute as well and is also a well-known figure in education and capacity building in dementia and mental health. Both of our speakers today have an enormous amount of knowledge and practical experience in working with people with, with dementia, um, uh, responsive behavior management, and also working with all of those uh, throughout the COVID pandemic. So please uh, take advantage of their knowledge and expertise today and enjoy, and I wish you to enjoy the presentation. So Mario and Andrea, please take it away. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and so much for inviting us to come and speak to you today. 
Some of you may have seen this parts of this presentation before, but hopefully not not its current version. We've really put a lot of work in terms of making it very practical and, and uh, uh, sort of applied in terms of the knowledge that we're going to be presenting to you today. Um, and uh, and if for those of you who haven't seen the toolkit before, please take this opportunity if you can to go and download it, and you know it'll give you an opportunity to sort of follow along as we talk through some some of the tools that we developed in part in the first wave. So this is how we've learned from the first wave um, and how we're tr now trying to apply some of these learnings um, to the second wave that we're facing right now. Um, so why don't we go to the next slide? Um, I do not have any conflicts relevant to this presentation to report. Neither do I. <laughs> Great. And we have, uh, and not having any conflicts, we haven't had anything to mitigate. So you can go ahead to the, yeah, to the next slide. Okay, so why are we here today? So we're here to talk about barriers uh, to effective um, infection control and prevention in people with responsive behaviors, to talk about strategies to support appropriate uh, infection control and prevention in people with responsive behaviors, and also to develop person-centered isolation care plans as well. So that's the three main goals of today. And what, uh, how's the date gonna run? Well, we wanna hear a little bit from you, what your experience has been so far and then move on to talking about infection prevention and control measures, the effects on the mental health and well-being of not only just your residents, but you as well, finding creative ways to foster security and joy in the work that we're doing during the pandemic, ethical framework for decision making, the Dementia Isolation Toolkit, and incorporating principles of person-centered care. And we're gonna give you some case study examples from both long-term care and the community, and we're gonna get your feedback from that as well. So we want to hear a little bit about you and your experience during the pandemic so far. Uh, what we would like you to do is get your browsers ready, either on your computer or on your smartphone. And uh, we encourage you to participate by going to www.menti.com. And in the next slide, there's gonna be a code that you're gonna put in so you can participate in uh, the Menti poll. Just something to keep in mind that the Menti poll is something that is anonymous. So please feel free to share your experiences. So let's have to go to the slide. All right, so uh, we want you to hear from you. Um, we want you to share a story of a time that you had to make a difficult decision about someone's care during COVID-19. So at www.menti.com, please input the code 495570 and we will wait for your responses. So, you know, part of this is trying to help shape our, our conversation, you know, understanding what your greatest challenges have been um, thus far. Uh, and we'll certainly try our best to, to sort of tailor our presentation to help address it, but also to get, you know, to get a sense of the kinds of difficult situations that you're, you know, that you're finding yourself in and the ones that you are, are you know, are important to you, things that are, are common, um, but, but um, important for us to address in different ways. So our moderator right posted. Uh, our moderator posted it on the chat as well. Uh, thank you, Matthew, um, and and the code, so you can copy paste it from there. So I think what we might see coming up, we might see some similar trends and themes that um, there's gonna be a lot of um, similarities in in the sector. Um, due to site closure, I did not get a chance to say bye to those I care for because of privacy, um, restricting visitors and families. Anxiety for a resident who could not see family. It was not myself personally who experienced this, but I have heard of staff struggling with keeping a person with dementia isolated for 14 days in a new environment like long-term care. Quarantining, the, the new quarantine rules have been really hard, yeah. Yeah. And a, lot, guess, a lot about visitors, <laughs> it's true. Uh, that's what I was going to say, Angie. I was seeing a lot of, about restricting visitors. Yeah. People who wander while they're COVID positive, having trouble implementing those measures in people where the risk is really high. Moving staff to COVID areas to care for our positive COVID uh, cases. That's a tough one as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so not being able to do home visits um, anymore you know, having to close down day programs, like those sorts of things, like restrictions in the kinds of services and activities that we were providing for people in the community have been really hard. Here's an interesting one, refusing people to be admitted to long-term care because they are wandering but not safe at home. 
Okay, so a finding that people are actually not getting the level of care that they might need just because that they, they can't move into long term care at this moment, or the long term cares aren't willing to accept them. Yeah. So this, this is great. So you guys, there are a lot of difficult situations that come up in a pandemic. Thank you so much for for your participating and then to people providing some personal things about their their family members and um, Yeah, this is great. And this is, I think, a lot of what we've been hearing. I wonder if we, um, so we're, we're going to just jump ahead to this one. And so these are some of the sort of ethically, ethically difficult situations that we are hearing about. Um, people feeling like the care isn't what it used to be, either because of the restrictions that people are under or because there are staffing issues or because they, you know, the activities aren't being run. So the quality of care isn't as good. Um, you know, feeling like the restrictions on family if, if obviously impacts quality of life and the quality of care. And then, um, so these are a lot of these are very focused on long term care, but obviously it also applies in the community as well, feeling like you have to follow these policies and procedures, even in circumstances where it may seem to conflict with what's best for the resident. Um, and, um, and then even, in, you know, not feeling like you have a lot of power, you know, that these are, you know, that there's this um, the directions from above, these are the rules that you have to follow and, and a sort of a sense of powerlessness in the front of it. So these are, this is kind of common to what we're hearing. So um, this presentation is about infection prevention and control and how we do it um, in people with dementia and how we can do it in a way that's compassionate. Um, and but what, just to be sh make sure that we understand what we're talking about when we say infection prevention and control, these are the kinds of things that we've been doing in institutions like long-term care and acute care. So you know, the pre preventative measures around vis around visitors, around um, wearing masks, hand hygiene. And then putting in place these restrictions around things like quarantining after admission, um, different kinds of physical distancing measures, not letting people congregate. And then obviously control is about identifying people who might have COVID, you know, really keeping on top of screening for COVID, and then doing a process of tracing contacts and then isolating people who may have COVID or who do have COVID. And so those, what's, what's happening in long-term care and in hospitals? Next slide, please. So in the community, we're you know implementing this in some in a smaller scale. We're doing all the masks and high, hand hygiene. Hopefully, you know, avo avoiding being in close contact with people. Um, and then we're also support. Hopefully, um, in Toronto, we're not doing this so much anymore. But working hard to trace contacts, identify cases, and then having people isolate when they're suspected of having COVID nineteen. So so these are these are the kinds of measures that we'd like to be able to implement um, in people in, and support people with dementia in in, in participating in. Next slide, please. I think what's really important to understand is that, of course, any single one of these measures is not super effective. Like if all we did was wear masks, COVID would still spread like crazy. Um, it's not one thing, but it's a whole bunch of different things that when you put them all together, um, you know, really help to uh, prevent the spread of the virus. And so the reason why this is valuable is that, you know, there may be situations where one measure that you're trying the best to implement is not being, you're not able to implement it in a perfect way for whatever reason that might be. Um, and so then that's where you start piling up all the other slices of cheese to, you know, basically reduce the risks of uh, transmission associated with this one imperfect way. So none of these are meant to be perfect. Next slide, please. So this was the sort of question that we came to in, faith, in, in the sort of first wave of the pandemic. Um, we were faced with having to put all these new measures. Um, they're not new, really. We've done these for a long time for infection control, but we've never felt quite as much pressure to do them perfectly as we are now. Um, and so we're thinking, how can we implement these in a way that is effective, that's safe, but that's also compassionate for the residents and for the people with dementia in the community? And that's sort of driving the work that we're doing. Um, one uh, big issue is the effects of isolation have been really um, uh, devastating in the community and in long-term care. And so what we're facing now is that we can put these measures into place, um, but without proper support and care for the people, for the, for the, you know, the, the residents and the people with dementia, then we may actually be causing um, more harm than good. And so um, we're going to talk a little bit about the sort of the negative effects of these interventions. And, and the reason why that's important is that obviously dictates the kinds of things we need to do to mitigate the harms associated with these measures. Um, so um, one of the things that is a big deal is um, whenever we're asking someone to confine it in their room, um, we talk about something called confinement syndrome. And this is typically you know, kept for people who are in a solitary confinement within 
um, prisons or people who are kidnapped. Um, but it's, I think, true of, of older adults now who may find themselves in a situation where they have very little sensory stimulation, you know, be, either because they have sensory impairments or because there isn't much going on in their room. They may not have much social engagement and their social cues are missing, right? The sort of the routine of going to the dining room and participating in activities is lost. The, the, these, this disruption to their routine affects their circadian rhythm. You know, they may not know what, when it's day, when it's night anymore. And then obviously physical activity is a really important part of, of our day-to-day um, -day routines and schedules. And so losing that, being confined in a small space has an impor uh, important impact in terms of deconditioning and mental health and physical health. The other thing that goes along with confinement is this idea of separation. And so I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist and so I think about this a lot and about the importance of our social bonds that we have with people. And this may be with family, but also the bonds with staff um, and with a lot of um, facilities having a huge turnover and, and changes in staffing, it's also um, present there as well. And so, so people who are, have these bonds disrupted can experience anxiety. They, they might even feel some kind of rejection. You know, why, you know, why is my family not visiting? Do they not love me anymore? And then finally, this can turn into a kind of grief where they can actually feel the feel the loss as if the, as if their family members have died. Um, and so, so that's obviously something as well that people are facing. So now we want to th uh, think about um, the residents that you're working with, or even your patients and clients in the community that you're working with. Um, going back to Menti in the poll, uh, we want to see which of these symptoms have you observed developing or worsening in people living with dementia during the pandemic. We want to see what your experience is with your uh, patients, residents, or clients in the community. And there is an option for I haven't seen any because it's true. Some, in some cases, you might not have seen any of these behaviors. So we've given you all of these different options. So the, the options are... Do you want to read through them just so people can, oh, there are, <laughs> there, are yeah. <laughs> there are balls, there are balls flying everywhere. Um, yeah. Depression and withdrawn seems to be high so far, the highest. Anxiety, aggression, oral intake. This is a very strange graphic. I, <laughs> I like it though. <laughs> but it's really showing the impact. I feel like uh, we get to see, oh, so. Wow. So far, depression seems to be uh, the highest. Mm -hmm. We'll give people maybe another 20 seconds or so to throw some, throw some balls at us. <laughs> it's interesting to see that uh, there's not one ball in the, I haven't seen any new or worsening behaviors. Oh, the number for Menti is at the top, 49, 55, 70. So for all the slides, that's where you'll find it at the very top of the slide. So Mario, maybe we can um, summarize what we've had so far. So it looks like so far, like uh, depression um, is the highest followed by anxiety. Typically depression and anxiety go hand in hand. Um, uh, child with aggression and, and withdrawal. Um, so there's paranoid delusions as well, poor oral intake. And we know that again with um, depression, we might see reduced and uh, re reduction in oral intake. And there's an interesting increased number in uh, delirium. And if you think about the actual um, virus itself, uh, we might see signs of delirium in the person who has uh, COVID-19. So we we've even seen we've even seen people become delirious just from being isolated. So you know, with, with actually no no COVID. Yeah. So the thing is, what we're seeing is there's other um, there's many other causes for responsive behaviors in the pandemic as well. Um, as mentioned, you know, there's that isolation, there's a loss of programs, activities, and supports. Uh, thinking about the staffing numbers and the staff to resident ratio, not enough uh, time for members of the team to really spend that quality time with the residents that they used to before uh, the pandemic hit. Uh, lack of time to address needs, uh, thinking about meeting the, just the basic needs. Um, lack of time to apply non-pharmacological strategies. Yeah. So sometimes we can jump ahead to the pharmacological I mean, they're going to have a um, Inexperienced or unfamiliar staff, you know, thinking about the ratios and, and you mentioned it earlier that the staffing level has changed. You're having a lot of agency um, uh, staffing usage as well. 
caregiver stress, anxiety, and fear. So it's not only just um, the residents themselves, it's the families, uh, uh, whether it's their family of choice or um, formal or informal caregivers as well, and uh, staff stress, anxiety, and fear. So. And, and I just want to think about the anxiety that, so our anxiety obviously influences the people we work with too. And it's, you know, when, when we're feeling worried or anxious, um, I think that that often is picked up. People, people with dementia are pretty, um, pretty good at reading emotions in others. And so that certainly is a, an impact on it. So I mentioned earlier, like we, we're, we thought about even like delirium. Um, so we know it's change in uh, behavior when we see a person who uh, has delirium. And so that when we think about a person who has COVID-19 um, and uh, has dementia, it does look different than the typical population. We can see delirium. Uh, you might see headaches, coughing, muscle, joint pain, abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, loss of taste or smell, sore throat, refusal to eat, unexplained falls, fatigue. So if you're noticing any of these signs and symptoms and it's a change from the person's uh, baseline, definitely think about COVID-19 and think about um, getting those uh, swabs done because three out of four people living with dementia and COVID-19 do not have a fever. And that's not should be like the baseline as to why or whether a person has it or not. So get those COVID swabs done. And so also when we think about when we're working with our, 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 our residents, patients, or person, our clients with dementia, we've got to think about how do we foster that sense of security and joy even in these uncertain times? So when we think about security and joy, um, thinking about sensory stimulation. So um, thinking back on some of the trainings that some of you may have uh, received, um, uh, thinking about um, uh, dementia ability, Montessori methods of uh, putting these uh, different strategies in place to really help support the person in their environment. Um, thinking about music and not just any kind of music, music that's really like uh, catered to what that person likes and enjoys, art, food, uh, thinking about scents, aromatherapy, uh, and, and ways of incorporating touch um, in uh, our interactions even during this time. Um, and how is it that, what, that even during this time when uh, people are very isolated, there's restrictions um, in, in interactions, how do we reinforce those social bonds with the person's family, friends, even when we think about reinforcing those bonds with the staff in the long-term care home as well? Uh, we know that uh, a person with dementia does well when they have good routine and schedule in place and the environment is very predictable with that routine and schedule. So how is it that we can incorporate a routine and schedule so there's, or continue on with that person's routine and schedule so there's less interruptions. Uh, thinking about cues and uh, reminders within the environment, whether it's uh, visual cues in the person's room and how often we uh, even use verbal cues with that person too. And you know, when we think about the behaviors that we are seeing, um, we want, sometimes we respond to what we are, what are the undesired behaviors and that reinforces those undesired behaviors. So how is it that we can positively reinforce the desired behaviors that we are seeing and use that positive reinforcement and thinking about um, also physical activity, like how can we um, support the person with physical activity during isolation so that they don't lose uh, mobility and even their independence. Uh, and there's a lot of different creative ideas that have been posted in social media from different, um, so here we have the example from Schlegel Villages um, about their ice cream carts that they've uh, incorporated during uh, the pandemic. So there are a lot of creative ways to really keep people secure and safe within their environment, but also to really uh, instill those feelings of joy uh, during this time as well. So Angie, I'll pass it on to you. Thanks. Yeah. So, so you may wonder, like, why are why would we bother talking about ethics? You know, should you know, is this gonna, is this really necessary? And I think that you know, the conversation we had at the beginning about all the different kinds of difficult decisions and situations we find ourselves in, I think, really helps to highlight why why an ethical framework is a really useful place as a starting point in the pandemic. Next slide, please. And and one thing that the ethical framework is really designed to address is this issue of moral distress. And, and this arises when you know the right thing to do for a patient or a client, someone with dementia that you are working with. But for some reason, you know, you can't do it. The, the pandemic is in, getting in the way. And this creates a real threat to our, um, our values and our integrity as, you know, as healthcare providers. And so, so there's lots of examples that you guys gave earlier, places where you know, you're seeing people's care suffer because there aren't enough resources or because their families can't come or there's not enough support, um, or you know, we're, we're being asked to isolate someone for, for 14 days and, and we know that that's not gonna be good for them. Um, and so, so how do you get through this? So the idea behind this toolkit is really about um, supporting moral resilience. And so that's our next slide. 
So this is really about helping us figure out how we can work through difficult decisions and, and actually how to make those decisions in a way that protects our sense of integrity and also, you know, helps support our residents. Uh, and this is this is obviously really important because the, the hazard is when you when you don't support this kind of problem solving that people actually won't make a decision and obviously not making a decision is also a decision but but probably not a good decision um and so so really helping people to problem solve to work their way through difficult decisions um creatively with flexibility and adaptability and that's sort of the kind of mindset that you need in a in a crisis like this um and and making sure that we you know we that what we're doing is a way is is aligns as best as possible with our own sort of personal and professional values so this is where the dementia isolation tool comes in. We have kind of two aims. So the, you know, the first aim, the, the one that we kind of put on the cover is that it's about supporting compassionate, safe and effective isolation and quarantine of residents with long-term care. But we actually have this sort of secondary aim, which is really about supporting the, the moral resilience of long-term care staff so that people um, who are or working in long-term care, and honestly, not just in long-term care, in the community, anyone who's working with a population that's being affected by these measures um, uh, is able to you know, act um, in a way that supports their own um, integrity. And so there are four parts to the toolkit at the moment. The first is an ethical guidance tool. Then we have a person-centered isolation care planning tool. There are some communication tools that we can use for people with dementia. And then there's an eth ethical decision-making tool. So we're gonna go through these tools and sort of in a practical way and talk about how you can use them. I'm just gonna start by, this is what it looks like in case you haven't seen it. And there's the link again, it's dementiaisolationtoolkit.com if you want to download it. And the tool, ethical guidance tool really takes us through this idea that we, we're making decisions a bit differently now in the pandemic. And it, it used to be that, you know, we'd always be making, doing the decision that was right for the individual. But now we're not just thinking about the individual, we're thinking about the whole community and the impact of these, you know, the, the, um, the virus is having on the whole community, not just the individual. So we, you know, we have to protect the whole community. Um, from the virus, but then we also have to make sure that any way in which we're restricting individual freedoms doesn't cause unnecessary harm to that individual. And so, um, so that's kind of what the, the tool takes us through is that a bit of that reasoning. Next slide, please. So I'm going to take you guys um, through uh, a case example. So this is a kind of an amalgam case that involves a few different people that we have worked with um, in the pandemic. And so this is a, a situation that would obviously be a, a source of great stress. We have an outbreak of COVID across multiple units in a long-term care home. And we have an older woman who is now COVID positive and her roommate has passed away. So she's in a room by herself. Um, she has moderate dementia. She's a well-known character in this long-term care home. You know, she's known for being um, kind of quite stubborn, quite independent. Um, she's, you know, she's, she's got COVID, but she's really mildly symptomatic, if symptomatic at all. She's maybe a little bit tired, maybe a little bit more confused than usual, um, but, but not, no real symptoms, um, but really doesn't have any insight into the outbreak or the fact that she has the virus and she doesn't want to stay in her room, but she's, you know, in a, on a floor where there are as a mixture of COVID positive and COVID negative residents. And she is moving around in and out of common areas and maybe occasionally even going into other patient rooms. And she seems to be searching for something. She even wants to go down to the ground floor and she gets quite angry when the staff redirect her back to her room. Next slide, please. So this is someone with a history of collecting and hoarding behaviors. She has very strong beliefs about the, she, she grew up on a farm. So very strong beliefs about exercise, fresh air, hard work. Um, doesn't really think that staying in her room is going to help anything. Um, and, and doesn't really believe in, in sort of modern medicine, you know, doesn't want to take pills, you know, doesn't, isn't on a lot of medications, is, you know, quite a healthy person, um, and also very fiercely independent, and, you know, really wants, really only interested in practical things, like doesn't want to do coloring, because she sort of doesn't see the point of that. She used to be walk around wiping tables, picking up garbage, you know, making herself useful. Um, that was sort of her role. Um, next slide, please. So this is a real conundrum. Um, we have to find some way to isolate this resident because um, she presents a real risk of, of uh, um, spread of the infection to residents who are COVID negative. And so th that, that's, a, that's a key responsibility that we have. Um, but then we also recognize that there are real risks uh, of harm with being more restrictive and how we try to keep her in a room. Uh, and so we have to find that a balance in some way to minimize any harms that we that come with how we, we go about isolating this individual. 
And so there are three different ways of thinking about how we minimize harms. I'm going to just briefly touch on the first two. Uh, um, and, and then we'll talk a little bit the third as well. But the, obviously, the use of environmental strategies are really important. You know, it's really it's like an ethical imperative that we have that if there's a, a way that we can um, cohort residents who are co uh, COVID positive so that we don't have to be re too restrictive in terms of their um, isolation to their rooms, then we need to find that way. Uh, and so I'll hopefully um, in many circumstances, we're working hard to find ways of cohorting residents. Um, and uh, the second is, you know, although there are visitor restrictions in place, that there are ways to be creative around the use of family and essential caregivers. And so some um, homes have found ways to, to incorporate them into the, into the isolation in different ways. Um, and so that's, you know, that's obviously a, a, a less restrictive way of, of keeping someone in their room if they have a family member or essential caregiver who is willing, willing to be there with them. And then finally, um, we have to find ways that are less restrictive. Um, and try to implement these uh, to, you know, to see if there is any way of supporting them in isolation. And so there's the next slide. So some, some examples of minimally restrictive uh, interventions are things like um, door alarms, different ways of video monitoring someone in their room, obviously putting up different kinds of reminders that they should stay in their room. This is a, a half door. I don't even know if it's legal in, Can in Ontario, but it's something that they're doing in the Atlantic provinces is using using half doors to keep people within their rooms. Anyway, so, so these are the kinds of examples of minimally restrictive interventions that we have used with some success um, on our unit in situations where we've had to isolate residents. And so um, one of the ethical principles we talk about in this framework is this idea of reciprocity. And so the idea is that um, we have to, you know, if we're asking people to stay in their room, if we're taking away their freedom to move around the, the facility, we have this duty to mitigate the effects of this isolation on them and make sure we support their needs. And so this is where this idea of person-centered isolation care planning comes in. How else are we to best meet their needs other than by thinking about what those needs are and a plan to address them? And so the isolation care plan that we have in our Toolkit talks about personhood, engagement, supporting needs, and reminders. And I think Mario is going to take you through some of these. I will. So, thank you. So, the thing is, when we think about what uh, we're facing in uh, during the pandemic, uh, sometimes even just the way that we talk about the situation can affect um, how the team is thinking about the situation. So, even thinking about how do we reframe the problem from here's an example, how can we make her stay in her room? So thinking about the case that we just uh, brought up to how can we support her needs to help her stay in her room? So even just like thinking about that, that statement, that's a very supportive statement. We're now starting to change the language, think, change the frame of thought to, well, how do we develop a plan that's really gonna help care and support this person addressing her personhood? How do we engage her? How do we support her needs? And what, what, kind of, what kinds of reminders does she need based on what the, that we know about her? So uh, this, is, this is the infection control and isolation care plan worksheet that is in the dementia isolation toolkit. Something to keep in mind, you know, this is, these are examples based on the case that um, we just presented to you. It's gonna look different in every case and um, not, you may not be able to fill out every single box um, 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 right, right at once. It might be coming through conversations throughout you continuously revisiting the plan. But so here's some information about personhood. So like, what do we know about this person? Their likes, dislikes, values, previous roles, uh, professions, what are their capabilities? What kind of relationship do they have with their families? So some of the things that we did uh, find out about this person is that uh, she does have strong beliefs about hard work and exercise, uh, likes caring for others, she hates waste, does not believe in taking pills or other medication, and she's also very close to her son. So these are some things that we know about her. And you know, we, always, we also always wanna find out the reason, well, what's causing this person to want to leave the room? Like what, is, what are the reasons for them leaving the room um, or to bring them out of their room? So in her case, she's the kind of person that she really believes uh, in exercise to keep her healthy, to fight the virus. Um, and you know, thinking about the fact that she's also had an experience of her roommate dying in that room, there's some anxiety that's related to that. And also you know, thinking about being separated from her son having that ability to get in touch with her son on a regular basis. So she really does want to call, uh, but doesn't actually have a phone to do that. And also thinking about, you know, what helps the person to come back to their room. So like, what, like how can we make that uh, environment more inviting? So offering the person uh, to take the person for a walk. So we know that it, we're keeping the person safe on the unit. I might need to do some like reverse isolation in that, uh, in that respect. 
um, you know, if, if she doesn't have access to um, a phone, um, thinking about where can she access the phone to call her son so we can relieve some of that anxiety that she's feeling um, about being separated from her son. And also thinking about uh, spending some time brushing her hair or even holding her hand, so having that clean in contact with her. Thinking about it from an engagement perspective, thinking about what are her interests, what does she enjoy doing? Because we know that you can't just give a resident just any activity. It has to reflect uh, past interests, uh, past roles. So something that she really enjoys doing is folding towels and clothing and helping to clean her room. Uh, thinking about you know, giving um, what something that, some things that we could give to her around that. Uh, uh, so giving her some old towels and clothes and maybe even seeing if the son can bring in some of these uh, items to help support uh, the home in implementing these strategies. But also like if you want her to have more regular access to the phone and not really come out of her room to go to the, uh, the, the nursing station, can the son actually bring her cell phone or even like uh, attach a landline uh, so that uh, she can have that call when, with him when she needs it. Um, so thinking about how do we engage her, you know, about topics that she's interested in talking about to really connect with her, talking about her childhood on the farm and also, um, thinking that she likes to joke with the staff, you know, engaging her in, in jokes. And also who do they enjoy spending time with? Well, the thing is she does enjoy spending time with the staff when they give her jobs to do uh, or to hold her hand uh, and brush her hair. So again, having that connection with her during those, uh, those tasks that she enjoys doing. So how do we support her needs? Well, what, do we, what, what does this person need help with? So she needs supervision for the exercise of the walking around the unit because you might not be able to stop her from leaving the room. Exercise is very important to her. Um, so you might need to think about reverse isolation measures to help uh, support her in um, exercising or walking around the unit. Uh, but also thinking about what is this need about keeping busy and feeling useful and how can we support this need with the tasks that we give her. Um, keep trying to uh, keep her in her room or to invite her back into her room what are her favorite foods or drinks? You know, having fresh fruits available for her because um, that's something that she does enjoy. Regular food is something that she's not really motivated by, but it's more the fresh fruits, but having that readily available for her in her room. And also thinking about what things uh, and our people bring them joy and pleasure. We do know that um, she does um, like talking to her son and to her grandson. So contact with them is something that's very important. And again, the cell phone is gonna help out with that. But uh, how do we positively reinforce the behavior? So anything that she's doing very well, especially doing well in her room, thanking her and telling her what a huge help she is is something that can help reinforce that positive behavior as well. And finally, thinking about, you know, how do we keep her in her room as far as the reminders are concerned? Um, you know, what does this person understand about the needs to stay in their room? There's times that she does agree that there is the bad virus, but she doesn't necessarily always believe that she has it because of her symptoms are they're quite minimal compared to other people that have got it in the home. So she doesn't really understand that this virus is contagious or why she needs to wear uh, the PPE. So she does need some reminders around that. Um, so what are some of the reminders that were effective or can try with her? You know, remember that bad virus that Linda, her roommate had, because that's something that caused her a lot of anxiety, the death of her roommate. We need to make sure that doesn't spread to other people here you need to stay in your room for X amount of days and uh, maybe pointing to a calendar in the wall that shows those 14 days. And we're gonna show you an example in just a bit. And we can go for a walk together with a mask at one after lunch and point to sign. So even having like that set schedule for her, those routines, uh, those walking routines with her and uh, uh, making sure that she wears the PPE. And um, thinking about what other, some, uh, some of the um, cues that you can have in her room um, that might be very helpful for us to give her that visual message when you're not around her, using signs to remind her to call staff before leaving her room, but also to reinforce that there is this virus, um, uh, this bad virus that's happening in the, in the, on the unit. And uh, those, the door alarm that Andrea showed an example of earlier, that door alarm can actually alert staff that if she's tried to leave her room, um, the staff can hear that uh, sound and they can um, support her in uh, redirecting her. So once we have these, uh, once we've outlined uh, a lot of this information and we've, we've gathered all of this information, how do we put it into a plan? So the planned approaches for this person will be to put signs in room, including a calendar, scheduled walks with PPE to the garden with the staff, 
telephone calls the regular to the son. And if she does um, have access to a phone or we can get her access to a phone from the son to provide it to her and maybe even planning those times that she's gonna have the contact with the son. And also uh, uh, the uh, recreation therapist to visit her for 10 minutes every hour when she's on the unit for positive reinforcement and providing her with those tasks that are meaningful to her such as the towels and the cleaning activity and use of as needed medication only if she's persistently trying to enter other residents' rooms or refusing to return to her room. So again, we wanna use those least restrictive measures first. And um, we wanna make sure that if we are gonna be using these medications, that there is a discussion to evaluate the plan of PRNs are using, but also the effectiveness of the PRNs as well. So some examples of some of the signs that are included in the toolkit, um, so we have the days remaining in isolation here. This is, this is something that I'll uh, post it. Uh, we could post in a room and we could say to her, you know what? Every day that goes by, we cross out and we could even have her cross it out with us. And we can reinforce like, look, you're doing so great. We're almost there. Hang in there. So just keep it up just to really offer that positive reinforcement and keep that sign posted in her room. Thinking about, you know, if she's ready to leave her room, posting this somewhere that's at her vision level. Uh, so she sees uh, this uh, reminder that there is this deadly virus going around and uh, also to cue her to stay into the room to help stop the spread of the virus. But if she is to leave the room, here's the sign that will reinforce that, hey, if you are to leave, the, do not leave the room by yourself, get the nurse. So maybe even using the call bell or calling out to the nurse to ensure that she's not leaving by herself, that there is somebody there to support her in that supervised walk and to ensure reverse isolation protocols are in place. That's the thing, you're a wealth of knowledge, experience. Um, you have a lot of uh, tools in your tool belt. A lot of you have gone through a lot of training sessions and education sessions around dementia and dementia care and the management of responsive behaviors. So thinking about, you know, what are some strategies that you could put into place? You know, putting frequency, not duration of interactions. So how frequently are we visiting the person? The shorter but more frequent visits, the better. It's not about the length of the visit at the end of the day. So there's something uh, for those who have taken pieces, your pro attention plan and putting a pro attention plan in place to help support those frequent uh, visits um, and making sure that everybody is on board with that. Again, thinking about establishing routine structures and schedules, you know, for those who have taken gentle persuasive approaches in dementia care, we talk about the impro uh, importance of having routine uh, and, and structure and schedules, but also having um, um, the regular people uh, approach and interact with that person and work with that person. We know that when there is that consistency in the caregiver, it leads to better relationships with the, uh, with the resident. Use validating approaches before reassuring approaches. You know, again, um, the situation, they, they may still be trying to process what's going on, but what's real about the situation is how they're feeling. And again, as we've learned in gentle persuasive approaches, validation really does go a long way and really acknowledge how that person feeling and the great example here is, yes, it is not a great situation. It does suck. And just being very honest and very forward with that. And you, again, using those frequent reminders and cues. You know, again, thinking about for those who have taken dementia built in Montessori way, uh, those environmental cues and making sure that they're placed in a place that is visual to that person. Where is it at their uh, level? And are we ensuring that it's, uh, it's communicating a very clear uh, message to that person? We don't want to make it too complicated with the visual cues. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the decision making process again, because um, I, I don't know if you guys are experiencing this, but everyone has a bit of decisional fatigue at the moment at this context in, in the pandemic, every little decision, like whether you go for a coffee, whether you go meet your friends in the park, you're constantly weighing the risks and the benefits of everything that you do. And so that's true, obviously, in our in our lives as healthcare workers as well. We're we're weighing all these decisions, and and so how do we how do we reach decisions in a way that can are reasonable, right? How do we achieve that 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 standard? Um, and so the idea is that there's a way of doing this. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about doing making decisions that are reasonable, responsive, that are open, that are accountable, and that and actually build trust um, in the in the within the healthcare team and also within the people that you are caring for. 
So this is the isolation decision tool that we have. And obviously this is not something that you would complete every day. It's not a tool that's designed for that, but for those particularly challenging situations where really involve a lot of different people and where you know there may be a difficult decision to be made, it makes sense to go through something like this. The first thing that you start off with is trying to understand what the danger is that you're trying to prevent. And the reason is that you have to make sure that any decision that you make is proportionate to the risk. You don't you know, use a machine gun to blow out a candle. So, so you, um, in this case, this is a, you know, there is actually a substantial risk. We have someone who's day four post positive COVID test. They're asymptomatic, but they're likely infectious at this point. And they're, you know, they're going into other residents' rooms who are COVID negative. So that's a significant risk. And you obviously, you know, want to be able to document that. The next step is to think about what have you tried? And what was, the, what was the effect of these different things that you've tried? And so here, you know, if you've done an isolation care plan, that's great because you can say, well, this is our plan. This is what we've been trying. Um, and, you know, the risks with this plan are pretty min minimal. You know, um, we, they have they come out of their room with staff, but they're wearing PPE and, you know, we're doing a good job with it. But there are some, you know, um, some benefits associated with this approach. Um, it seems that, you know, for the most part, we're addressing her needs. But you know what, in terms of efficacy, it's only been working about 80% of the time. You know, there's this time in the evening, she gets, you know, a bit of sundowning. She's, you know, very hard to direct back to her room at those times. So what's been happening is, um, uh, or, you know, she's been getting PRNs. At, in the evenings. And so, okay, so what, what's the strategy that we're considering now? Well, maybe we're thinking about scheduling some quetiapine at 5 p.m. Okay, well, what are the downsides? Well, she might actually become confused. She might fall. She might make her worse. But, you know, so far it seems that the PRNs were working. And so, you know, okay, you know, we're going to think about trying something like this. So, but who have we consulted in this process um, when making this decision? So, um, you know, we've been this is obviously an important point because if you have someone who's COVID positive who you're having trouble keeping in their room or keeping them in their home, actually this is a public health issue and so public health actually should be informed that you're having this difficulty. They, they might have some solutions that you haven't even considered. You know, they might say, oh, but you know, um, let's get them to this other COVID unit or let's get them, you know. So, so definitely you want to um, inform public health. You want to make sure that there's leadership and management involved in the decision. You can certainly consult the resident if they're able to participate. You would speak to their substitute decision maker. Um, and then you might consult some of the team members who have been involved because obviously uh, you know, every shift might have a different perspective. They know the evening shift is saying this is terrible. The day staff says, oh, it's going well. Um, so you want to obviously include some more consultation. Um, but yeah, that's it for that slide, great. Oops. There we go. Come on. <laughs> We've jumped ahead. There we go. So, so after you've gone through that process. What's going on? There we go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, after you've gone through that process, then, um, then you can come up with a decision. So you're going to keep going with the isolation care plan. You're going to try to schedule some quetiapine in the evening. The team's going to review and you're going to adjust it with feedback. You're going to communicate the plan in a particular way because it's no good coming up with a decision that you don't tell anybody about. Um, and then you're going to figure out ways to minimize any risks that you've identified. So you're worried about the quetiapine, so you're going to maybe check her blood pressure a little more often. You're going to monitor for side effects of medications, and you're going to mitigate the length of time that she's going to be on it because you know you're setting up a red zone in your in your nursing home, and you're going to be able to move her to that red zone in two days. Um, you're going to keep track of how effective this plan is by you know, you know, you could use anything. Here's the BSO DOS. You're going to initiate that. So you're just going to keep track of every time she comes out of her room. So you get a sense of how effective this is. And you're going to assess this every day for the next two days. And, and you know, because the, the idea is that your plan has to be responsive. The risk changes every day based on what's changing with the individual. Say she suddenly develops some really severe COVID symptoms. You don't want to necessarily continue to give her the quetiapine because now she's in bed and she's not leaving her room. So, so that's why you have to reassess the plan. Um, so the idea, this is kind of an overview of the idea of how you have to always move from least restrictive to most restrictive wherever is possible, and that it's not an either or kind of situation. It's not that you're, you, you only do non-pharmacological or you only do pharmacological. There, you know, the, the, the basis is you're always doing the non-pharmacological strategies and that you would only move to the more restrictive measures if they're necessary, but then do them in conjunction with the non-pharmacological strategies. So that's the idea. So we're at the cases now. Yes. That's great. So we, oh, we don't have a lot of time. We might have to just do one. Yeah. So we have uh, two, well, we have what two cases here. Um, 
we, what we want you to do is uh, think about what information do you want to know about this person and how will you use this information? And we're gonna have a mentee poll for that as well. So case one is an 89 year old uh, with dementia moving uh, into long-term care because of his wife's poor health. They lived alone. He's placed in a 14 day quarantine. He's confused and comes out of the room frequently to ask for his wife. He doesn't recognize her on video calls. He's spending long periods of time in bed and isn't eating well. And he seems to believe that his wife is dead. So again, getting that menti poll out, uh, www.menti.com and using the code uh, 13, 62, 11, and three uh, to answer what information do you want to know, but also how will you use this information as well? I don't know if it, it, can you keep the poll active and then go back to the case for a second, just so people can see it? Does that um, work or does it? see if that works. Um. <laughs> no, if it doesn't work, that's fine. This is the case, yeah, the case is just, yeah, this gentleman who's coming out of his room and then he's kind of becoming more withdrawn. See what the case uh, results look like. Oh, there we go. Can the gentleman read no, still? It's so would visual reminders help uh, him remember where his wife is? So again, using those visual cues and reminders. History, social background, uh, work, family history, health conditions. Okay. Yeah, I mean, he's, there's been a change in his in his his mental status. He's different, right? So what's happening? Is he is he unwell? You know, that obviously has to be assessed. Can he use the phone? Would it help to talk to his wife? So again, thinking about what kind of technology are we uh, are we using here? We can't use we can't use video calls for everyone. That's not it's not everyone's cup of tea. <laughs> yeah. The basic telephone might be the the, the right answer here. Uh, planning to use this as a case study during weekly huddles on nursing. Okay, yeah, please, uh, uh, please use the case study because um, this is what's going to help, and um, that's what that's what we're here for, or that's what it's here for. Are there hearing and visual impairments, uh, social history, and no calming? What are some calming strategies that maybe the family knows of uh, that can help? His interests, hobbies, past routines, like dislike for food and activities, any possibility of alternate visits with his wife, visual cues, set up a routine, engage. Again, interests, a lot of, a lot of um, comments here about his interests. And is there any family members that he does recognize? Uh, he may not recognize the wife, but oh, he recognize other family members. So, I mean, I think what we're, we're seeing here is, is people are thinking about personhood. They're thinking about um, how we can support this gentleman through this 14-day quarantine. You know, I also, you know, something to think about is, you know, um, again, about this idea of um, not assessing the risk, right? So say he's just moved to long-term care. He's only seen his wife for six months. He's got no other contacts. What are his risks really of having COVID? Um, and, you know, can we, you know, address this, you know, this, this may be life threatening for him. He's not eating well. Can we find some way to help with a, a window visit? You know, you know, it isn't in the spirit of keeping him quarantined in his room, but, you know, there are ways obviously of minimizing any risks of these sorts of things. And, and if, if he's experiencing such a severe harm from the quarantine, you know, then, then we kind of have a duty to, to figure out what the best way to minimize this harm would be. I think we're, um, we are really, coming close to the end of our presentation. So I wanna have an opportunity to take some questions. So we're gonna skip through our second case um, and just wrap up with this idea to, you know, um, so how important it is for us to take care of ourselves as healthcare workers. It's this toolkits about supporting you as well as your residents, you know, making you feel okay about the decisions that you're, you're making and the, and the sort of position that you find yourself in um, and, uh, and thinking about how ethical decision making can help you if you encounter your difficult situations and advocate for what's right for your resident as well as, um, as what's safe. Um, so just quickly, I, I think we'll find a way to get you these slides, hopefully. There's some resources we're going to show you now. If you, um, so next slide, please. So just I encourage everyone to go to the Brain Exchange webpage where they have some um, really great uh, COVID-19 resources that are around supporting engagement and, and such like that, therapeutic engagement and behavioral support. Um, next slide. Um, this is a really nice infographic that was developed by a research team around different ways, uh, evidence-based ways of supporting social connection. 
Um, I want to thank the whole Dementia Isolation Toolkit Working Group and the, uh, their work on this and um, our partners who have been uh, very supportive. And that brings us to the end. So we have an opportunity to take, take a few questions. Thank you so much, uh, Andrea and Mario, for this uh, great presentation, very practical. Uh, I think in the midst of a pandemic, it's so helpful to have such a structured tool and a way to think about those issues and, and challenges and, and kind of walk through them in a systemic way. Um, I want to open up and see if there is any questions from, uh, from our audience, any comments, anybody wants to share experiences or even experiences of using the tool. Please feel free to unmute yourself or post on the chat. Uh, people on YouTube, you can also post on the chat uh, on the YouTube and we'll copy it into the Zoom so we can respond to you. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Eric, you have muted, unmuted yourself. Are you trying to ask a question? No, I was just asking my team if they had any questions, and they said no. So I'm going to unmute. I'm going to mute myself. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Nice so, to hear you, um, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and people are asking if there will be access to the presentation. Certainly, with your permission, Mario and Andrea, we're happy to circulate it together with the links to the recording yeah. after the session. Lindsay Glover, I think she said she would like to share. Lindsay, you would like to share something? Well, lots of thank you and uh, great patient <laughs> comments. Hi, sorry. Um, I just wanted to share that I had a really positive experience with um, a resident that was on a 14 day isolation um, with, um, it was really organized. The team there had had the room um, and given me the ability to set up the room for the resident. Um, we added like a, a table in there with a chair. So it was kind of like the breakfast, a, a breakfast nook. Um, we had, I had take, printed out like colored photographs of waterfalls and things from her hometown, which was um, in Jamaica and, and put in like a plastic fake plant. Um, and then the one, the one amazing thing was we had an iPad uh, for her that we programmed uh, with a daily agenda so that in the morning she had woke, she would wake up and we would have the spiritual care on there. Um, there was a sermon that we had programmed from uh, Jamaica. And then we had it set up so that, you know, she had she, we, a routine, like she would listen to her favorite music, have breakfast. If she was getting anxious or wanting to try to leave the room, like her behaviors were um, wandering. So we would, um, we, we experimented with different music to get her to come back in the room, like play the music, get her attention and then sort of dance her back into the room. And um, she also had a, robo a, a robotic cat that she would like to sit in her lap. And um, the, the iPad was amazing. You could put audiobooks on there. So there were stories, um, relaxing beach sound for when she was starting to get um, a little hyper aroused. Um, and um, yeah, it's just, if you can get an iPad and have a team member on the recreation team or someone overseeing it, and just making sure that you just put on the, the, the specific um, pieces of music or whatnot throughout the day, then it's, it, it's a great idea, I think. It's just- One of the things that, the, that we're working on now on the toolkit is actually something that's very similar to that. So like a, a remote controlled iPad or a tablet that residents can be in their room. And so that someone could actually have, you know, control of like 10 tablets in one facility and just be, you know, putting in programming for everybody <laughs> constantly, you know, like, oh no, no, they're getting bored with this movie. Let's mm -hmm. switch it over to the golf or, you know. Amazing. Yeah, so we're working on that um, because we know that obviously it's a, it's a challenge to, if you have a lot of people who have to isolate at any given time, how you deliver. Anyway, so that's, that's what we're working on right um, soon. <laughs> Yeah, our guy is starting on Monday. That's great. That's great. Uh, that story. Um, and, uh, you know, thinking about like the, the strategies that you, you mentioned, they're very simple strategies too. And that's the thing we want to make sure that the strategies are reasonable for the team to be able to. <laughs> Excellent uh, story there. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, so, uh, Lindsay, just for those who don't know, uh, just to introduce you, she is one of our personal support workers working for the behavior support team in long-term care. Um, and thank you for providing more, more of those practical examples. It's actually a good segue to our topic for next week because we're going to be talking about uh, additional ideas 
uh, for engagement and recreation um, and some supportive communication approaches. So that will really uh, complement this presentation that we had today. I am not seeing um, any additional questions very nice Actually, comments. I wanted to make one qu uh, quick comment. Like, uh, Lindsay's part of an excellent resource in the Toronto Central Lynn. Get in touch with your external resources to help you in support, uh, to help support you in developing plans and implementing the plans. Your VSOTs there, your PRCs, your GMOTs, definitely get in touch with your external resources. We're there to support you with the implementation of this toolkit. That's a great reminder. Thank you for that, Mario. Uh, our poll questions were also on the screen. I hope that you got a chance to respond to them. If not, we've also, Matthew, maybe you could post again the, uh, the polls and the, and the uh, survey link. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to, please participate so we can, can learn from your feedback. Uh, we are at time, so I really want to thank our, our speakers for today and uh, for a very engaging and, and informative presentation. I wanna thank everybody who participated today. And I wanna thank our moderators, Agnes and Matthew at the back end that we make sure that everything works smoothly. Um, so thank you again, everyone for joining. I hope you join us next week, same time, same day for the next topic of our series. Have a great rest of the week. Please stay safe and well. Bye everyone. Thanks, everybody. Keep safe. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.